And uh, if you want to turn in your Bibles now to Romans chapter 9. If you got one on the way in, it's page 943. Otherwise, don't worry, the verses are going to be right up behind us here. But in, we're going to do Romans chapter 9. And the title is, It's God's Call. It's God's Call, Romans 9, 7 through 29. Now, this is a shocking sermon. Have you, I've tried to get something farm, because you know I grew up on the farm. Uh, have you ever had a really bad electrical shock? Anybody ever got that one? Which reminds me, we were talking about people falling. Jake also fell this week, so pray for Jake. He took a bad fall, all right? So pray for Jake. You mentioned uh, uh, Chris and, and uh, all. So have you ever had a really bad electrical shock? On the farm, we got lots of them, unfortunately. Usually it was the electric fence. You know, we had the electric fence that you know, was like a wire that went around, and that kept the cows in most of the time. And, and it wasn't a huge jolt, but it, for a kid, it was pretty shocking. Even for my, I wouldn't want to touch it. Now, sometimes we would grab that electrical fence by accident, or we thought it was off because we were working on it, and somebody was supposed to have unplugged it, and they forgot. And I'll never forget, you grab all that, elect that wire, and it's like, and you can't let go. You, you remember uh, Jurassic Park, the kid was, wouldn't let go, right? But this was a lot less than that, thankfully. But you just can't let go. It's the worst feeling. Have you ever grabbed an electric fence? Anybody? No, you can't. It's, yeah, it's bad. And finally you let go. I'm like, why would I let go? Because we're in, we're in shock. That's why. It could have been worse. Um, <laughs> I've never told this story before. I'm going to tell it. My uncle, my mom tells a story about my uncle Chuck, who, uh, I wasn't named after him. I'm named after my grandpa. But anyway, my uncle Chuck, and he, uh, my, my mom's brother, he wanted to know what would happen if he peed on the electrical fence. <laughs> Don't ever do it. My mom loved to tell that story. Don't ever do it. All right? But I'm going to shock. I've never told that before. But I've never, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shock you today. It's bad. It's bad. I'm going to shock you today. This will be a tough pill to swallow for many of us. This is the hardest teaching that you will ever hear. I've always kind of dreaded preaching it, but I'm here. I'm in Romans 9. I've got to do it. Uh, it, it. It's really tough. We can't skip it because it's God's word. Brace yourself for a shocking truth. For many of you, you're going to be grabbing a hold of the electric fence for the first time today, and you're going to be like, I want to let go. All right, but, but, but I better start with prayer. We're going to need it. All right, so, Father, we thank you for your word. <clears throat> we thank you for how it's changed our lives, Lord. And now we just pray that you would help us with this really difficult teaching to grasp it, to accept it by faith, to appreciate what it really means to us. And I pray that if anybody here has never put their faith in Jesus, never given their life to him, that today would be that day. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so remember last time I was here a couple weeks ago. If you weren't here, listen to that. We've been going through the book of Romans. Get caught up on the whole thing. It's in the bulletin, on the back of the bulletin. There's different ways that you can listen. But we talked about... God's righteousness defended. <clears throat> and specifically, what about Israel? What about God's chosen people? And once again, go back, listen to that beginning of Romans. But now in Romans 9, we're going to look at God's sovereign choice regarding Israel. But it also has shocking implications for every one of us, as we're going to see today and the next few weeks. We're going to see the implications that it has, for, not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles too, for all Christians. We're going to see that. Now, first of all, I want to look at a couple different definitions. Election. The first one is election. And the word election in the Bible means God's choice of certain groups or certain individuals for his, to receive his grace specifically to receive salvation. That's election, okay? Predestination, which many times gets mixed up with the election, predestination is used only for Christians. A lot of people say, I don't believe in predestination. Well, if you're a Christian, you do, because predestination refers to Christians, and it indicates God's purpose. Once we put our faith in Jesus, God predestines us. It, he, his purpose is to make us Christ-like. He wants to conform us to the image of Christ. So everybody who has put their faith in Christ is definitely predestined, okay? We're to become like Jesus Christ, okay? The third word is foreknowledge. Does God know, God knows ahead of time who will and who won't be saved. He knows that ahead of, ahead of time, and we'll talk about the implications of that in a little bit. That's foreknowledge. And then free will or free choice is we must decide whether to follow Jesus Christ or not. We all have to make that decision, okay? 
Now, salvation. Here we go. Is it a free choice or free will or is it election? Do, is it our choice or is it God's choice? I'm going to give you the answer right now. Yes. Now we can all go home. Okay. <laughs> But God, but here it is true in a sense. God's sovereignty and our free will are taught side by side in Scripture. They're both taught, and it, it's it's confusing to us, to our finite minds. This is an infinite concept. It's confusing to us, but it will make sense in eternity. I always stress that in, when we get to eternity, it's going to make sense there. Remember Einstein has the, the rule uh, of the two parallel lines? He said if Einstein, uh, Einstein said two parallel lines cross in eternity. That was his laws, whatever it was, right? And I'm like, well, this is the same thing. These are two parallel lines, free will and God's sovereignty, and somehow they're going to connect in heaven. We're going to have to wait. That's where, it's, that's where they're going to connect. Um, People have been fighting about this for a long time. The Calvinists versus the Arminians. There's actually been some wars fought over it for a long, long time. In fact, Charles Wesley, uh, no, John Wesley and George Whitfield had quite a battle over it during the Great Awakening back in the 1700s. The Great Awakening, George Whitfield sparked the Great Awakening with his preaching. He had a God used him in the United Kingdom, and then he came to the United States, and worldwide, it was just crazy, the, the amazing Great Awakening that happened under Whitfield, and then he convinced John Wesley to come along with him and to help him in his ministry, and he, he set John Wesley loose, and Charles Wesley, who did the songs, and, and together, they just had such an, a powerful impact for God's kingdom, but they had a big fight. They actually had a falling out. They actually broke their relationship with each other over this very topic. I'm just going to read you a couple of things they said back and forth. Remember, this is back in 1739. People talked a little differently. They fought differently back then. This was before there was, um, you know, internet and <laughs> all that. So uh, Facebook, they could just lay, lay into each other. But anyway, Wesley, this is what he says on free grace. Nothing but the strongest conviction, not only that what is here advanced, Oh, wait, I'm going to say it. Not only that what is here advanced is the truth as it is in Jesus, but also that I'm indispensably obliged to declare this truth to all the world would have induced me to openly oppose the sentiments of those whom I highly esteem for their work's sake. Talking about Whitfield, okay? At whose feet may I be found in the day of the Lord Jesus. The grace or love of God, whence cometh our salvation, is free in all. And free for all. To this some have answered, no, it is free only for those whom God hath ordained to life. And they are but a little flock. The greater part of mankind God hath ordained to death and is not free for them. Them God hateth, and therefore before they were born, decreed that they should die eternally. And this was his good pleasure. This doctrine repre represents our blessed Lord Jesus Christ the righteous, the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth, as a hypocrite. A deceiver of the people, a man void of common sincerity. This is the blasphemy clearly contained in the horrible doctor, decree of predestination. See, he mixed it up, the predestination, election, that's what a lot of people do. And here I fix my foot. On this I join issue with every assenter of it. You represent God as worse than the devil, more false, more cruel, more unjust. That's Wesley's view uh, for, for free will. Whitfield's response, he wrote a 31-page pamphlet. I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs. Uh, and a year later, Jonah could not go with more reluctance against Nineveh than I now take my pen in hand to write against you. Talking about Wesley, his good friend, although they're not friends at this point. But what can I say? The children of God are in danger of falling into error. Nay, numbers have been misled. And when I remember how Paul reproved Peter for his dissimulation, I fear I have been sinfully silent too long. Oh, then be not angry with me, dear and honored sir, if now I deliver my soul by telling you that I think you are in this you greatly err. The most important objections which you have urged against the doctrine as reasons why you reject it, being seriously considered and faithfully tried by the word of God, will appear, will appear to be of no force at all. 
Indeed, had not your name, dear sir, <laughs> been prefaced prefix to the sermon, I could not have been so uncharitable as to think you were the author of such sophistry. For Christ's sake, be not rash. Give yourself to the reading. Study the covenant of grace. Down with your carnal reasoning. It often, this is the best part, it often fills me with pleasure to think I shall, how I shall behold you casting your crown down at the feet of the Lamb as it were filled with holy blushing for opposing the divine sovereignty in the matter you have done. So you, you, you see them going back and forth. And this is, this is historically a big battle between, uh, between free will and God's sovereignty, okay? Now, predestination is actually clear and agreed on. He brought in, John Wesley mentioned predestination, but he's mixing them up. He's really talking about election. In predestination, remember we looked at this in Romans 8, 39 to 40, where he said, for, I'm sorry, 8, 29 to 30, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called those he uh, called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. So really, there's really no argument about predestination. Predestination is straightforward. Once we put our faith in Jesus, once we are saved, it, it, Jesus locks, God locks us in to become like Jesus Christ. That's what predestination is. There's really no discussion on predestination. Everybody agrees on both sides. They just get mixed up on the words they use. But predestination is we're going to become like Jesus. God sets spiritual for, his spiritual force in motion. The Holy Spirit is going to make us like Jesus Christ, okay? Very straightforward. Foreknowledge is a little trickier. Does Foreknowledge, does God know ahead of time, or does he decide ahead of time, right? Does he know ahead of time, or does he decide in advance who will become Christian, but the hardest, as we will see today, is election. God choosing who will be saved. Let's go to the tape. <laughs> Let's go to the passage. Romans 9, verses 6 to 9. It is not as though God's word has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are descended are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned, in other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children by the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated, at the appointed time I will return and Sarah will have a son. Okay, so far so good. We're okay so far. Now it gets tricky. Verse 10 is where it gets tricky. Here we go. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by her father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. But on God's mercy. Election is clearly taught here in Acts 9, clearly taught all throughout, all throughout the Bible. We saw election all throughout the book of Acts. Remember when we were doing the book of Acts, I kept saying, hang on to this, we'll deal with this in Romans, right? Acts 13, 47 to 48, when Paul said, For this is what the Lord has commanded you. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. We kind of miss that, don't we? All who are appointed for eternal life believe. Even Paul himself, and we saw how Paul was called. Paul was killing Christians, persecuting Christians. And what happened? God knocked him off his high horse, blinded him, called him to be a witness to the Gentiles, right? He picked Paul. He didn't pick all the other guys. He just grabbed Paul out of that, out of that group. It was crazy. Many of us have the same story. We're ambushed by God. Anybody here remember being ambushed by God? 
pulled by the Holy Spirit to salvation. Many of us could share stories of how we shouldn't be here. We should be dead, right? We, you know, we, we, somehow we survived X, Y, and Z. It was a miracle. Why? It was all by God's grace. Many here could tell the testimonies over and over how God somehow saved us. Remember Linnell, who passed away a couple years ago. He used to love to share how he was the only one left out of his entire family and all of his friends. They're all dead. And he was the only one still alive. And he, look what he survived, the drugs and HIV. And I met him in the AIDS house here. And he gets saved. He becomes a powerful witness here in New Hope. But he would say, I'm the only one. I'm the only one. We, we hear these stories of election every day. In fact, I don't know if you were following, um, <clears throat> if you saw this story, if you read Voice of the Martyrs or some of the Christian publications, it, crazy story. It's a miracle. Muslim men in Gaza seek Christ after over 200 dream of Jesus the same night. There's millions of Muslim men out there. But listen what happened. Listen what happened. More than 200 Muslim, Muslim men in Gaza have converted to Christianity after reportedly seeing Jesus in their dreams, said Christian professor Michael Lacona. Lacona teaches New Testament studies at Houston Christian University, and he's also written a number of books, including The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus and Paul Meets Muhammad. <clears throat> in a recent post, Lacona said he received a report from underground Christian ministries in the Middle East that detailed what is happening. God is working in the midst of the war, he said. Over the past two days, we have ministered to hundreds of fathers who have lost most, if not all, of their children in the war. As we move these men to safety... We fed them, washed their clothes, began to read the Bible to them, sharing the way of peace through Jesus. Then a big miracle happened. Last night, Jesus appeared to more than 200 of them in their dreams. They have come back to us to learn more from God's word and are asking how to follow Jesus. About a month before October 7th, Hamas the Hamas terrorist attack, Assemblies of God News reported that Muslims around the world were dreaming of Jesus and converting to Christianity at an unprecedented rate. This is election in action today. God is giving these dreams to these people, and they're coming to Christ just like the Apostle Paul, just like the book of Acts in Gaza. Crazy, right? Crazy. Uh, God, we, 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 we see what, what, is, what is going on. All of us can remember a time, think about when God gripped us, when he drug us kicking and screaming. Anybody remember that? Kicking and screaming. And, and he saved us. And we look back on it now, we know it was all God who did it. That's election. And verse 16 says what the purpose of election is, where it says, it does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. It's all, that's the, the whole point of it. Grace over works. Grace over works. We can't work our way into salvation. It has to be a gift. It has to be a gift. And so Paul is teaching that the whole point of election is faith over works. Faith over works. We have absolutely nothing to do with God saving us. He does it all. He does it all. Then Paul gives an illustration to, to talk what he's talking about. He talks about Pharaoh. In verse 17, he says, Paul says, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Wait a minute. That doesn't seem fair, right? That doesn't seem fair. Verse 19, Paul figures, knows what's coming next. He says, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But look at Paul's response. Paul then responds in verses 20 and 21 where he says, but who are you, a human being? He's saying you're an ant trying to talk you know, to a, a scientist, right? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? I warned you. 
I warned you this was going to be hard. Some of you are holding onto the electric fence right now. And you're like, what? what? And now look at the reason that he gives. In verses, it, it's just a flow here. Look at the reason he gives in verse 22. What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? We sang the song today. Love that song. Whom he prepared in advance for, for glory. That's the reason. God has, the Holy Spirit's telling us here that God has shown us mercy. We should have only known wrath. Every one of us should have known wrath. And those who receive the grace of Jesus Christ and are saved, when we receive that, the people who don't turn to God, who are not given that grace, are a reminder to us of what we were. We were objects of wrath. But now we've received mercy. But when we see these people, when these people do all these evil things around us, just watch what's happening in our world, that's a reminder to us of what we were and of what Jesus has saved us from. Ephesians 2, 1 to 2, tells us what we were, the way we were. In Ephesians 2, it says this, verse 1, as for you, you have that one? Oh, okay, I'll just quote it. I hope I can do it. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. Uh, that's verse 1. I got lost, too. Um, when you follow the ways of this world... Uh, I'm going to look it up. All right, I, I have it, but I can only get through one this time. Uh, Galatians, Ephesians 2. Here we go. As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That was all of us. We were dead in our sins. We were, we were, we were, uh, that's what God saved us from. We were lost. We lived these empty lives. We were miserable zombies, spiritual zombies. We were the walking and dead. We were experiencing hell on earth and facing hell for all of eternity. That's what we were. But be, the result of election is God made us objects of mercy instead of objects of wrath. And the result of election here in verses 24, uh, back to Romans 9, verse 24, even us whom he also called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. And he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. The result of election is that Gentiles, all those who are not Jewish, we are, uh, many Gentiles are now called to faith in Jesus Christ. The, our salvation, the Gentile salvation, is a result of, of this election process. But God is not done with the Jews yet, even though well, I talked about that last week, two weeks ago. Go back and listen. He's not done yet. God is still has a purpose for the Jewish people that's apart from the church. He has a special purpose. In verse 27, he says this, Isaiah Christ concerning Israel, though the number of the Israelites be like the sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved, for the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom, we would be, have been like Gomorrah. And so we, we see here, and we're going to see this as we continue in, in Romans, that God will save a remnant of the Jewish people. There are already many Messianic Jews that have turned, many Jews that have turned to Jesus as their Messiah. And like I showed last time, there's a remnant that will be ready for Jesus Christ's return. They're already getting ready. I talked to you about the soldiers, how they're singing, waiting for the Messiah. And when, when Jesus comes again, there will be a remnant, that spirit, that will all turn to him at the same time. I read you those passages last week. And so all Israel will be saved, Romans 11, 26. It's, it's going to happen. There will be a remnant of Jews that won't receive the mark, that will stand up to the Antichrist, that will have desperate messianic expectations. And when Jesus comes, they will put their faith in him. And so all Israel will be saved. At that point, the remnant will be saved. Okay, so that is the flow for election and predestination. and, and all, no, So now that you're all traumatized, let me give you some encouragement. 
going to help you breathe here. First of all, don't fight about it. I tell people all the time, don't fight or judge other people because they're an Arminian or they're Calvinists. Don't fight about it. Uh, don't judge those who struggle with this concept because it's tough. Calvinists tend to uh, tend towards spiritual pride, uh, which is crazy because the whole point is we're nothing, we're dirt, right? And even worse, I've known some Calvinists that don't witness because I don't need to. God's going to save. Who's going to save? So that's the bad thing. Uh, Arminians, on the other side, tend to ignore some very clear teaching <laughs> from Scripture. They tend to ignore that. And their arguments are often emotional and philosophical, <laughs> not biblical. Both sides, I stress this, both sides don't fight. Both sides need to focus on what we agree on, what we agree on. John Wesley went scorched earth on this topic. He just went crazy. Whitfield stayed above the fray. He, he even turned his churches over to Whit Wesley, even though he believed different from him, he turned his denomination over because he just wanted to go out and preach the gospel, and he let Wesley do the organizing of the churches. He turned his people over to them. That, he, was, he was really uh, just really good about this. But Wesley went, broke, went scorched earth. He broke with Whitfield, who started the Great Awakening and pulled John Wesley in, but he still broke with him. Later in life, he matured, he, and he reconciled with Whitfield. He preached his, ser his funeral sermon. Listen to this exchange between, because it's really good, between uh, Whit Whit uh, Charles Simeon. There's a guy named Charles Simeon who was a Calvinist. And I got it. Ah, here it is. Charles Simeon and John Wesley. And listen to this exchange. Because this really shows why we shouldn't fight about it. Simeon said, Sir, I understand that you are called an Arminian. And I have sometimes been called a Calvinist. And therefore, I suppose we are to draw daggers. Be before I consent to combat, with your permission, I will ask you a few questions. Pray, sir, do you feel yourself a depraved creature? So depraved that you would never have thought of turning to God if God had not first put it in your heart. Yes, said Wesley, I do indeed. And do you utterly despair of recommending yourself to God by anything you can do and look for salvation solely through the blood and righteousness of Christ? Yes, solely through Christ, said Wesley. But sir, supposing you were at first saved by Christ, are you not somehow or other to save yourself afterward by your own works? No. I must be saved by Christ from first to last. Allowing then that you were first turned by the grace of God, are you not in some way or other to keep yourself by your own power? No, said Wesley. What then? Are you to be upheld every hour and every moment by God as much as an infant by its mother's arms? Yes, altogether. And it is, and is all your hope in the grace and mercy of God to preserve you unto his heavenly kingdom? Yes, I have no hope but in him. Then, sir, with your leave... I will put up my dagger again, for this is all my Calvinism. This is my election, my justification by faith, my final perseverance. It is the substance of all that I hold. And as I hold it, and therefore, if you please, instead of searching out terms and phrases to be grounds of contention between us, we will cordially unite in those things. We agree. Powerful, huh? Powerful. Don't fight about it. Don't fight about it.
Don't stress over it. Don't stress over it. You will never be able to understand it. I know it's going to happen. Some of you are going to go home and going to like, well, I want to try to figure out. Stop it. <laughs> Remember the video? Stop it. All right. Stop it. You're, you're not going to be able to. Many can never accept this. They do biblical backflips to try to explain it away. Some people even leave the faith over this issue. They say God's not fair. God's not fair. And you know what? They're right. But not in the way they mean it. Not in the way they mean it. All, every one of us who ends up in hell, anybody who ends up in hell, we deserve it. The whole human race deserves hell. If I die and wake up in hell someday, I'll be like, I'll be disappointed, but I'll be like, I deserve it. I deserve hell. We all deserve hell. The only ones who don't get what they deserve are Christians. They're the only ones. The real question really is, why does he let any of us into heaven? That's the real question. Why? God's not fair. You're right. He lets some of us in heaven, and he shouldn't. That's not fair. Not, not why does God save some but not others, but why did he save me? That's the question. Focus on what we can understand. Don't, don't focus on what we can, we'll never understand. Focus on what we can understand, and that's God's mercy and grace. That's what Paul's stressing here. God's mercy and grace. Focus on that. Just believe it by faith. God's sovereignty and human responsibility are both in God's words, and we're not God's word, and we're not going to understand it until we get to eternity. Someday in heaven, I think we're going to be able to process this and connect the dots, but we're going to have to wait till we get there. But until then, just believe in Jesus. Just appreciate God's mercy and grace. Rest in God's love. Rest in his love, which caused him to sacrifice his own, one and only son in our place. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Rest in his love. And many people, when I'm talking about God and stuff, they'll bring up this objection. Yeah, what about this Predestination, it's actually election, I say. Uh, but what about this, uh, you know, many others. What about, what about, what about the person in Africa who's never heard? Well, let, now they've heard better than most people in America. Yeah, Africa's an evangelized nation now. That used to be the thing. But what about the people who've never heard? What about them? I say, what about you? What about you? That's the only question you have to ask. We can wrestle through hard questions later. After you become a Christian, you can wrestle through all these hard questions and objections. But what will you do with Jesus Christ right now? And you know what the majority of them do? They reject him because they're just using those objections as an excuse not to submit to Jesus. I always bring it right back. What will you do? And I use John 3, 36, where it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. What about you? What about you? Have you ever been saved by faith in Jesus Christ? Or are you trying to work your way? And remember, it's all about, works, all about grace over works, remember? Are you trying to work your way in? Many churches and many church attenders miss this. They think they're saved by works. Well, you talk to them and you say, why, why are you going to get into heaven? What's, what's, what's your way in? And they say, well, I go to church. Or I was baptized as a baby or even an adult, baptized twice. Uh, I take communion. I, I follow the rituals and the rules of my church. I give money. Oh, there's a definite one that way in, right? I give money. That always comes in, five bucks. Anyway, they, uh... <coughs> now listen, there's nothing wrong with good works. Nothing wrong with good works. But they don't save us. They follow salvation. They show our faith is real. Good works are good, but they do nothing for our salvation, nothing for our standing with God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, then verse 10, where it says, For it is by grace... This is actually a predestination verse, by the way. Uh, do you have Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? 
Oh, how did I miss all these? Anyway, I'm sure it's my fault. So anyway, I was taking antibiotics. But anyway, uh, <laughs> for it is by grace you have been saved by faith. And this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. We're saved by putting our faith in God's grace. But the very next verse then talks about good works. For we are God's workmanship, verse 10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Notice that we were saved to do good works, but they did nothing for our salvation. They do nothing for our righteousness before God. Only faith in God's grace, his gift of his son. But they should follow. You better believe it. They should follow, right? That, that's, what, that's what shows that our faith is real, is our good works. But it has nothing to do with salvation. We're saved by faith. So many are deceived. Uh, the, this whole works thing has deceived so many people. Uh, World War II, history buffs know, will know this, Auschwitz. What did the sign over Auschwitz say as people are coming into Auschwitz, the, the concentration camp people? It said... Work liberates. Work liberates. Work liberates, which was a lie. Because what was the truth? The harder they worked, the faster they would die. It was a lie. And that's what the God of this age has done. With, with, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The God of his age is blinded with the big lie. Works save. Being good saves. Works save. But just like with Auschwitz, the harder we work, we die in our sin. We die in our sin. Heaven is a free gift. Works a changed life are essential. It proves that our faith is real, but we are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you put your faith in his death on the cross to pay for your sin? Have you put your faith, faith in his resurrection from the dead to give you a brand new life? Just like he had resurrection life, we have a brand new life in Jesus Christ. Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ and received the Holy Spirit? Have you done that? I'm going to pray in just a minute and give you a chance. Are Christians, are we allowing God to fulfill his purpose in our life? We are, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, we are predestined. You are predestined. Did you know that? Read it again. Romans 9, 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. To what? To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. God predestined us to become like Jesus Christ. We are, we are, are we surrendered? Are we surrendered? Are we allowing God to work his sanctification in us? We're already saved, but are we allowing him to sanctify us? That's God's ultimate purpose for our life. And God will fulfill his purpose for our life. Kicking and screaming, he's going to do it. No matter what, he's going to accomplish his purpose. In fact, right before that verse, Romans 8, 28, it's all connected. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We, we, God's going to work it all together. He's going to work us to his purpose. That's what he's going to do. It, it's guaranteed. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, does it, our life? But we know that God is working everything together for good, for his purpose. And I'll, I'll use an example that some of us just all lived through Joy Vanderbilt. We're like, why did God take Joy home? Why? It doesn't make sense. But we know God has a purpose, and his purpose for Joy's life was fulfilled. For her life. We know that. And anybody went to her memorial service, you heard the testimonies. You heard the testimonies. You heard the gospel. Paul preached the gospel clearly to everybody there. That was the purpose. What her impact on all those lives and everybody there hearing the gospel. 
God's purpose will be fulfilled. Let's pray. How is God speaking to us? Maybe you find yourself questioning God. God, what are you doing? Why is this happening? Why this trial? Why have I landed here? Why are you sitting here today? God has a purpose for our lives. Our job is just to surrender and pray. Say, God, show me your purpose. Fulfill your purpose in my life. And the number one purpose is to become like Jesus, conform to the image of his son. doesn't matter what we accomplish in life. All that matters is are we being conformed to the image of his son. It's the only thing that really matters. And maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith, maybe you're watching this day, you're listening today, and you've never put your faith in Jesus. You've never given your life to Jesus. You've never put your faith and hope and trust in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You can have that life right now. It starts this very moment you put your faith in Jesus and goes through all of eternity. Is the Holy Spirit pulling you? Are you being gripped by God? Surrender your life to him. The simple prayer of faith. It happens in our heart. We put our faith in Jesus in our heart. But I always encourage people to just say a simple prayer to put an exclamation point on that. God, I repent of everything in my life that goes against your word and your will for me. Every sin, every shameful thing I've done, every wicked thing I've thought, I repent. I ask you to forgive me. Because I'm putting my faith in your son, Jesus. His death on the cross to pay for my sin. His resurrection from the dead to give me new life. I put my faith in Jesus. I give my life to you, God. If you have prayed that prayer of faith, the Holy Spirit has come inside. You are now predestined to become like Jesus. I want to encourage you to tell somebody. Tell me on the way out. Fill out the card. Text me. Email me. Do you have a friend or a family member here? Someone at work praying for you, at school praying for you? Tell somebody so that we can be excited for you and help you in your new life in Christ to grow in your new life. Father, I pray for every one of us that we would allow you to sanctify us, that our predestination would be complete. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.